if there's any advice, what would I give to uh, young SNC coaches? Um, like, keep your ego in check. Yes. Like, you, you want to think you know it all. <laughs> um, I've been there, man. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with it right now. I did want to ask about your rock building skills, though. <laughs> Dude, man, oh my god, don't even get me started. That thing was a nightmare. I wanted it so bad. I wanted, I want to be the best coach that I can be, and I'm very impatient with myself. Uh, we, we think about all these traits that we want, but we never really talk about, okay, so if we were to develop an ideal human being, how would we teach, if we were to uh, develop a human being from start, how would we teach them patience? Yeah. Would it be by you know, giving everything uh, that they want when they want it? Probably not. So today's episode is with one of my favorite people in this industry. We met at UW and we've just clicked instantly um, for our love of food and SNC. And then from there, it's just a beautiful relationship. Um, we constantly talk and bounce ideas off each other, which it's what we love. Um, our many bro dates definitely helped. Um, and that was just a case of keeping up with each other's paths and just being friends. So, Chu, how are we doing? What's up, Manny? Thank you for having me on, man. That's all good. I appreciate it. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your pathway up until this point? Yeah, um, so you, you didn't really mention this earlier, but uh, for the viewers that don't know or the listeners that don't know, uh, UW, what Manny met by UW was University of Washington. Originally, me and him, um, we were interning there last year over the summer, helping out with uh, the summer football, um, football training camp. Uh, and that's where we initially linked up um, we were interning under the legend coach Ron Ma Ron Mack, yep, Coach Mack, uh, and then yeah, instantly like Manny said, we hit it off. Um, so, a little bit about my background. Um, I just graduated from Springfield College, uh, just received my strength conditioning certification, but before that, um, just a lot of internships, a lot of volunteering and internships from like physical therapy clinics to uh, interning at Springfield with our varsity athletes to University of Washington football and then most recently University of Health and Performance, which is a veteran based company. So a little bit all over the place. And now currently uh, I'm working as a personal trainer. I'm in like this in between uh, in between time trying to figure out what I'm going to do next uh, with my with my life yeah so you spoke about the different types of internships what originally drew you to SNC mm. uh, in terms of SNC man I, th I think it's very similar to a lot of other coaches in where we all started as athletes ourselves or interested in lifting and training um, human performance. So for me, uh, it was very much the same where I w wanted, I had big athletic aspirations, wanted to play uh, collegiate basketball and potentially pro and um, I fell in love with the training. I always knew I loved at the training i was always so curious about the human performance side of things and so that's kind of where that curiosity started uh and then from there when i got to college and i found out what strength and conditioning is then i was like that's that's what i want to do yeah <laughs> um so it's very very similar to, to a lot of other people's stories um for me growing up uh i didn't have many great coaches around when i needed uh and so then that kind of set me on the path of like, if I, you know, if I can be that coach that I needed uh, growing up for someone else, that is, that's kind of my, my why, my biggest why of um, why I want to keep pursuing this, uh, going down this journey. Yeah, I think you are right. Like for me as well, it was, I started 
as a young athlete, got into the SNC program, and then from then, my coach was just like, "Do you want to come and do a couple hours with me? You can sort of learn the processes, how to program." And I was like, "Yeah," and then that just developed into what it is now. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I have like two people in mind. Uh, uh, they're actually a pair of twins. They nice. own a um, a gym uh, in Guam, which is where I'm originally from. Um, and they kind of put me, or they've kind of put me onto the whole like the the training realm. That there's a side of PT and sports performance and strength and conditioning, and, and showing that like coaching can be a career. So shout out to Ryan and uh, Pat Claros back home in Guam, holding it down. Nice. Um, they yeah they they helped me through. Um, when when I was in high school and they they were the original like people that I was like man you know what like I want to do what they do yeah. so it was cool it's an interesting you say that because like the th- thing for me was the exact same like I didn't know I could make a career in sport let alone coaching people in the gym so I think until people realize that that's a, actually a pathway and you can help a lot of people as well um, like you said the two mentors that side you off have really shaped that path for you. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that and like how it is that you think that influenced and drove that passion within you? Yeah, um, like I said before, I think prior to meeting them, um, I didn't really have anyone in my corner. I didn't have many great coaches. Um, and I, I thought that I had the the mindset and the work ethic and the discipline to um, take my athletic endeavors far, but I just never had the guidance and it was always based off of whatever I could find online and whatever articles on, I don't know, bodybuilding.com that I was reading at the time. Um, And it kind of led me down a lot of like dead ends. Uh, Eventually I, tore my ACL Um, I was stupid and I was overworking myself Um, and then that's how I ended up meeting uh, Dr. Claros uh, Ryan Claros who was my physical therapist and helped me throughout the whole rehab process get back to being an athlete again and so um, spending time with him and his twin brother and seeing how they ran their facility and coached and worked with other youth athletes in Guam. I, I wished I had met them earlier because I probably wouldn't have gone down that yeah. or had those same tribulations having gone through, um, you know, tearing my ACL and a lot of mental health problems that I was dealing with at the time. So, um, and ultimately, yeah, like seeing them like make an impact on me and it ultimately made me want to kind of be in the same be able to be in the same position that they're in to then impact others and bring value to others nice um so obviously we were at washington together what was like your progress uh process into getting that internship and getting across there from obviously springfield uh so i remember (laughs) i it was my mentor at Springfield, uh, shout out Coach Adam Fight. He originally connected me with Coach Mac, and then from there, man, you know, what? like I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying <laughs> to rem- it's hard for me to remember what, how, like how exactly I got connected. I can tell you this though: uh, after I got connected uh, with Coach Mac, I sent in my resume, and at this point. Yeah, I was just looking for a summer internship in Seattle. Uh, And, you know, I was looking at uh, some other schools in the area. uh, But I wanted to get my feet wet in with like a big Division One program. Uh, And thankfully, I think it was, yeah, I think it was uh, Coach Fight who had connected me with Coach Mack from there, uh, sent in my resume, and then... Yeah, the rest was 
kind of history. I remember the the day in which I I got the internship. <laughs> I was I was at, I was doing my I was still doing my junior year internship at Springfield, and I ch- after, it was like after one of our sessions uh, with a team. I looked at my phone. I checked my email, and then it was an email from Coach Mac saying that I I got the internship spot, and I like ran outside and I was just screaming. <laughs> it was great. Nice. It was, great. it was cool. It was really cool. I think because obviously there was um, Caroline and Nate, Kev and Ryan there with us. Um, and that, I kind of like the different approaches that people have taken to get this internship. Obviously for me it was a little bit different. I applied and through the IUSEA and then got into it. But it's sick that like your lecturers are sort of connected to you uh connected you to coach mark and then from there it was just like obviously you ran out and screamed <laughs> yeah it no it, it is and um yeah i've been very much blessed to have uh developed a, a good relationship a great relationship with uh, adam fight um and he's he's one of those coaches that um, when I think of like who inspired me or who is like a model coach for me, he is definitely up there as one of those people. Um, and he's just a, an amazing human being and uh, he's been an amazing resource for me. Um, and and he's he's really helped me out a ton. So I, I owe a lot to him and um, wouldn't have had that UW. Um, so that's us back. We had some technical difficulties, uh, but we're back now. Chu's been kind enough to pull up the email that he got from Coach Mac, and we're just reminiscing on that. Um, so off you go, Chu. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, so I completely forgot about this, but I think what how I ended up at UW was my... Again, my mentor connected me with Coach Mac. From there, this was probably the winter of between 2021 and 2022. Uh, so before the summer in which we actually went to go intern, I was in Seattle. Um, I was connected to Coach Mac. I was able to go in and shadow one of the uh, training sessions. Um, and then from there, that's where I met AJ initially, uh, Coach AJ Middleton. Uh, and then yep um, and then got connected with Coach Mac he allowed me to come shadow from there I then followed up with Coach Mac when I was looking for that summer internship and at that point you know I, I had I had already shadowed with him and then uh, met him in person so nice. that was my story yeah um, so we were talking about the sort of you asking coaches for like 10 15 minutes of their time to mm-hmm. speaking about um just their experience and their knowledge and what they could pass down to younger coaches what were some of the lessons that they spoke about and some of the things that they were sharing with you that sort of has been impactful in your career as well i think the biggest thing is an overarching theme of everyone everyone's journey is going to look very different and you know this like the whole coaching staff that we got to be a part of at UW um, everyone had a different specialty and everyone yeah. brought something to the table and everyone fulfilled their own roles um Coach Cook was the Excel, Excel. guy. He knew, <laughs> yeah, he knew everything, the ins and outs of Excel. Uh, Coach Ben Creamer, he did all of the sports science. Uh, sport, yep, the sports science, but not only that, the hand fighting, yeah. because he's a big uh, martial arts yeah. guy. Which, he's a judo guy, black like, belt. Yeah, he. Uh, I think he 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 does like a bunch of different disciplines. Yeah, but like regardless, like he is, um, he is the one kind of pioneering the whole hand fighting thing in in football which is really cool to uh to to have seen and witness yeah, yeah. you know coach aj is the the meathead yeah, yeah coach Olympic coach Fink. yeah exactly so like 
all of the guys on that on that squad had a role and had their own specialties and when i talked to them it wasn't even necessarily about like the little gems that they were giving me it was more so overarching like everyone everyone has a different career path and everyone's a journey is going to look a little bit different and that's totally okay yeah and it's there's always going to be something new to learn there's always going to be more to know and there's always you're always going to f- have more and more rabbit holes to want to fall into yeah and so it's about you know finding finding what what interests you the most and ultimately where you want to end up and who you want to work with yeah it's amazing that you say that cuz you've always, obviously since then you've been at the vision 1 institute to then going on to do some veteran work how was that different and what are some of the different lessons that you've learned going from one to the other yeah uh, that's a great question Um, I think at at the end of the day even with my clients now that I work with in a general population setting you know I still treat all of my clients as athletes and I don't know if it's because it's the lens that I I, I come from and so you know if I'm wearing rose colored lenses then I'm always going to see everything in rose yeah but um, I feel like yeah it's the in terms of the problem solving it is no different whether you're working with a division one 18 year old football player who's going to go into the league versus a 60 year old veteran who has you know um steel rods down his spine because he's been jumping out of planes for 20 years it's no different in the sense that you're taking this person you are assessing them for their weaknesses and their strengths and then from there you're you're building out a plan to get them to where they ultimately want to be uh to get them better and to create better human beings um so in that sense it's it's all just problem solving and critical thinking and yeah the exercises that you'll do with them will look a little bit different but for the most part again it goes back to the problem solving um and trying to figure out what puzzle pieces fit where and then trying to piece things together. Yeah, before the podcast started, we were uh, talking about uh, Vernon Griffith and his work with uh, military and veterans and how he looks at his movements and say someone's not got a limb, what are you going to do with them and how he adapts his program. Um, have you had any experiences with sort of having to change something up because one of your athletes or veterans couldn't do a specific movement oh yeah a hundred percent again uh because the company that i worked for uh university of health and performance they they're um basically how they ran was they they'd have three week courses where they would have cohorts of veterans come live on their campus and then during those three weeks uh they will train and then they will basically get a f- holistic leadership, coaching, personal training, education uh, throughout those three weeks. And yeah. then they'll, they'll eventually leave with uh, their personal training certifications. Um, oh, okay. But in, and so every day they would come in and uh, for the first two weeks, we would conduct all of our morning training sessions, right? Now these morning training sessions, they're not targeted in the sense that you know we're trying to develop, like we're trying to get them really strong in two weeks, or um, we're we're running a certain programming scheme or anything like that. It's more so of tying in the things that they're learning during the curriculum into and then applying that and then uh, showing them how it will work in a in a group like workout session. So. A lot of it was speaking, being able to speak to the why we're doing something. Yeah. Um, so every every exercise and every, uh, I guess, 
theme behind the training, every reasoning behind the training and why you're programming things, we had to explain and be able to coach to the students uh, so that they can they can take away and make connections between what they're learning in the classroom to what they're actually doing in these training sessions. And so, man, I know I didn't that didn't really answer your question. No, it's all good. It 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 it's more so like the development path from like you, day one yeah, to the end it's, of the. It's more so of it's more so of like an educational like the the training sessions were were a supplementary like like essentially like a workshop to, yeah. to to help students learn learn that um the concepts that we're we're teaching them uh throughout the the modules but it also it didn't mean that they weren't training they were yeah. very much still training and so during the actual training sessions um yeah tons of modifications we because again you're gonna have a 20 some year old kid uh and then you're also going to have a 60-year-old vet who both need to, at the end of the day, need to, are, are doing the same program because that's what you wrote for, for the day. And so finding ways to tweak exercises, maybe, uh, for example, the easiest easiest thing I can think of is like trap bar deadlift, right? Yeah. Or, or deadlifts in general. So if deadlifts were written on the program for the day, okay, maybe for uh, the 60-year-old vet, will will put his will will put him on a trap bar and maybe we'll put a couple plates underneath to raise his yeah. deadlift up so he's not he's not moving as much we're decreasing the range of motion maybe if they can't do that okay what's the next regression that we can make or what's the n- next uh closest um substitution we can make for the exercise and so like figuring things out like that and um shout out to coach hunter and coach catherine down there they really pushed me hard to um think critically about how my program was going to be interpreted and received by all the vets that i was working with especially since you know i'm a 21 year old kid where you know all everyone's older than me and has so much more life experience and who am I to just go around calling the shots like hey this is what we're doing today and this is blah 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 uh, so it was definitely a very eye opening experience yeah. and a very humbling experience yes I think it's like that question in programs I think that's very valuable in this industry where people are asking for the reasoning behind exercises that they've picked and then if from that what can they regress or take progress from that to adapt to the different people that you've got like on your gym floor um so like with it what kind of philosophies were you using at the time and how was that different to what you've been used to before hmm it, you know i don't i don't think that it was really anything different it's more so of again thinking critically about okay what 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 is our goal here you know what is the goal what what if you're working with an athlete it's always about what adaptation are we Mm. trying are we trying to create right what type of stimulus are we trying to are we trying to elicit when i was working down at uhp because you know we're only with these vets for two or three weeks we're not going to make any serious changes in two to three weeks. Yeah. Um, we're not going to, you know, increase the squat a hundred pounds in two to three weeks. That would be amazing, though. That's how it would be amazing. <laughs> Shit. It was more so of going down to okay, what are they learning in their per- in, in their curriculum? How do we tie in what they're learning to into this training session? And that what are like what are the key concepts we want to teach them? Um, and then from there. Like going back to it like what is what is the goal behind us doing you know five by five on deadlifts for one day uh sprints before that what like yes uh because in these two weeks it's a short time and we want to expose them to as many different training modalities as possible so that also goes into it yeah like, okay we've we've touched a little bit on you know the strength stuff maybe we should touch a little bit on plyometrics maybe we should touch a little bit on power maybe we should touch a little bit on conditioning today so figuring out um how to tie in the educational aspect and then also uh still deliver in terms of training 
and eliciting um, or delivering a stimulus, that was that was probably the most challenging part because you know coming from an athletic background, you it's like whatever you program, your athletes are going to do, right? And they're not there to get they're not there to become strength coaches, so you don't have to educate yeah. them about about the whys and and how we're going to do everything and the the you know the reason for 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 every little detail but now when you're working with you know at an educational company where veterans are 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 trying to become coaches now you have to teach them like your thought process and so that's what made it really impactful that's where that yeah that impactful and made me really have to think out of the box or think deeply not out of the box but think very deeply about like okay what 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 am i trying to accomplish here what yeah. what is it that i'm trying to do and then be able to speak to that yeah obviously we've spoke about like your education in springfield um obviously springfield college has got very deep roots in the snc industry what sort of makes them that well into uh, this industry and how has that sort of prepared you for your path? Are you, are you, so, are you asking about why Springfield is has such a rich history for strength and conditioning? Both. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And to be quite honest, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't quite know the the, the lineage that well um, either. All I know is that within the strength and conditioning world. The reason why Springfield College is so well known is because we have a lot of alumni in a lot of different places. So, um, for example, Mike Boyle. Mike Boyle is a Springfield College alumni. Um, uh, I, there's and there's there's countless of other coaches that are at high level Division One schools. Uh, I know the head head S and C guy for. West Point football. He's uh, an SNC alum or a SC alum. Sorry. Um, there's a lot of people in the NFL that are SC alums. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of a lot of people all all over the place. And I, th- I th- honestly, I think the reason why Springfield has built that type of reputation is just because, or is because of well, one, we have a very deep network, but two, the curriculum in terms of getting getting kids exposed to these strength and conditioning um, facilities and other universities and uh, going off on internships, uh, being around mentors and coaches like my mentor, Adam Fight, who also teaches classes at Springfield. Um, he himself worked with the Carolina Panthers, um, has been a strength coach for like 20 some years and so he has a you know a plethora of experience his wife uh mary kate fight she also is a professor at springfield college and also has a very extensive resume when it comes to strength and conditioning um and has been all over d1 um, at d1 schools just being around people like that uh, i mean how can you how can you not take advantage and you know want to basically stand on the shoulders of giants right uh and propel yourself and then that's how you end and that's how a lot of my friends end up at really cool internship sites where they end up at big division one schools or um you know in the nfl or or other private sector um locations so Actually, I wanted to ask about that. So obviously, I know that you've got a really good connection with your mentor and some of the places that you have been able to get in contact with through his connections and through just reaching out. What's that process like for you with sort of mentors and mentorships that you've had? Uh, Reaching out to people? Yeah. And just like how obviously Adam Fai has been in your corner and just like helped you get mentorships or internships and stuff like that so um i think it's it's honestly about cultivating relationships you know people always talk about networking and i don't necessarily like the way networking sounds because it it sounds so transactional in that okay i'm only getting to know you because i know 
that you might come in handy our relationship might come in handy later on down the road which to me i'm very much a people person i i I never i never burn bridges i i when i when i reach out to someone it's because i truly admire them and i want them in my circle and not just as someone who okay i'm gonna use you to to then reach this next level uh or i'm gonna use you for your connections and i never saw it that way it was more so of man you are someone i want to learn from you have a lot of knowledge and i i want to pick your brain and i want to i want i want you to be in my circle and so it's it's like the idea of trying to surround or build your net um build your inner circle of people that you spend the most time with right it's like you're always going to be the sum of the people you spend the most time with so if i can build my my circle to have these amazing people that i look up to that's going to push me to want to be a better coach and constantly push me to want to be a just a better human being overall and so um in terms of reaching out man like I connected with another coach who has uh, who has been with me along this journey ever since I was a, in uh, freshman year. He came to speak as a guest lecturer one time at Springfield. Um, his no- name is Coach Matthew Ibrahim. And with how our relationship began, I've never even met him in person yet, but how our relationship began was just through a DM. I After he came to speak at our school, I just DM'd him saying thank you for sharing his knowledge and saying that uh, or just being very appreciative of that. And then from there, um, we had built up a, a, a relationship over the past four years. I'll reach out to him. I'll check in with him. And, you know, he's a guy who truly cares. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal human being. And so little things like that with Coach Fight in junior, senior year, I was, I was in his office once every week <laughs> i was i would book up his um office hours once every week even when i didn't have him as a professor just because i knew i wanted to to learn more from him um and so i i i would it was like our our weekly shop talk <laughs> every week same time i would go in i'd sit down in his office and we would just talk shop sometimes we just talk about life sometimes our discussions would be more pointed towards like oh i'm reading up on this topic or i heard this on a podcast or what do you think about this and you know he would offer me his two cents and i did that every single week yeah i, I think I took out i think that goes back to what we were saying because like when i when we were in aida you obviously did the exact same with some of the coaches each week you try and get a sit down with them and just ask them and pick their brains which i think i and initially when i started seeing you doing that i was like i asked you like what what is it you're talking about like what's what is it that you're asking what kind of things are you going through and you're like honestly i'm just picking their brain looking at their journey and asking questions what they think about this what they think about that and how they're applying that or they're not applying it and that kind of that makes a lot more sense as to why you develop that habit of just like anytime you've got a mentor or you're in an internship you pick up some other time and just sort of progress your learning and progress what your thoughts are on the industry what what yeah. originally like what originally brought you to start booking up his time and just picking his brain on it hmm. you know I think it's again it comes from a desire to want to to learn I think I, I think I'm thankful that or I'm thankful that early on in my career I, I, I say I say that like my career <laughs> it has been very long it literally just started <laughs> but I think early on with like volunteer experiences, especially, I wanted it so bad. I wanted, I want to be the best coach that I can be, and I'm very impatient with myself. Yeah. And I, I want to, I always want to expedite that process, even though I know it's impossible because you need the experience and you can't expedite experience. I think piecing together um, mistakes and successes and 
strengths and weaknesses from other coaches and hearing from their journeys has helped me learn so much in terms of okay how do i navigate and how do i go about then developing myself as a as a coach and so early on it was just a hung again it was just a hunger for knowledge man i i if you want it bad enough you'll 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 reach out and you'll i mean what's the worst that they can say the worst that they can say is no yeah and and who you know if they say no or if they leave you on red then like so be it at yeah. least you tried like, i don't want to go to bed thinking that i didn't i didn't i didn't at least try yeah i think that's right? something that we originally connected on because obviously i've got a saying shy boys don't get sweets and that mm. that is it like the worst shy boys don't get sweets i like that one I might steal that one Do i ever heard that one <laughs> but like so one of my um coaches when i was in the development squad and try going through trials and stuff he yeah. sat everyone down and he was like look you are doing your trials like shy boys don't get sweets if you want something go get it it's yours but you have to want to to have that passion to like really like this is mine i'm going to take it and then from that like that saying has always just run true for everything that i do um like the internship opportunity that i got at u-dub only came because I saw the application come through and I was like, well, shy boys don't get sweets. What's the worst that's going to happen? I get a no. I'd be better off even if I did get a no because at least I've had the experience to apply for something like that. So I think that's something that obviously we've connected because we're, we're really similar in certain aspects where we always have to drive and thrive for that next best thing and just how can we further our education? How can we further our experience? And like, even from like some of the coffee shops that we went or some of the restaurants that we went, we would always talk about like, we'd bounce different ideas or different program structures. I know you, at the time, you were really big into French contrast. And like the way that you're yeah. explaining it, like you hadn't just read it on TikTok or Facebook or Instagram. You like, you took time to research everything you could on it and then you were relaying it back to me and I was like that makes sense I like how he's applying that into his whole, his own training and just further developing that so I think I think you need that to be successful and obviously you've had the experiences that you've had and you're successful in your own right um with some of the internships that you've done I did want to ask about your rock building skills though <laughs> dude man oh my god don't even get me started that thing was a nightmare holy shit i was i was it was like it was like watching if if someone had a camera watching me build that dumbbell rack okay so for for some background right at my last internship at university of health and performance there was a three-tier dumbbell rack that i had to build as one of my projects uh and i was the only intern and I didn't want any other help from anyone else so that I could say that I was the one who built the dumbbell rack. <laughs> and so, man, like, I wish that there was a camera, there was a time lapse watch, like, watching me do that because it probably looked like a monkey trying to build a rocket <laughs> ship. Man, you know what? We got it done, though. The, it, the rack goes from five pounds all the way to 150 pounds in five pound increments. So moving all those dumbbells and then putting them back onto the rack and then realizing I fucked up and then having to take it <laughs> off and then re, it was, man, it was, it was a whole two, I think I got it done in like two days, two or three days. Nice. Um, but if you ever need a dumbbell rack, <laughs> don't ask me because I will not <laughs> I'm, I'm, it has given me PTSD. It has actually given me PTSD. What's some um, of the lessons you've learned from that? <laughs> oh man. Uh, read the instructions <laughs> very closely but uh like going back to what you were saying um you know it made me think of another thing where um uh, i think you need to drive but then i think you also need to know that opportunities aren't going to fall onto your lap doors aren't just going to open it for you you have to you Chase have to go up. out and and go grab those goals you create you have to go you can go create your own opportunities right and sometimes you might go down one dead end 
you might find you might go down a hallway and it's a dead end but then you realize that there are three doors surrounding you and then each door opens up to a different direction so it's like okay maybe that's not a dead end that's not the definition of dead end but like what i mean is um sometimes you might a, a door might close in your face but then four or five others might open or s- you might realize out of the conversation you had with this person like oh okay maybe i can't do this but now my gears are turning and holy crap i have like three or four new ideas that I can try out or uh, maybe I can pivot in this direction that I didn't even know about that I could do um, had, I, had I not even just gone on the journey uh, or gone on this journey to start with. And so, yeah, realizing that um, you very much write your own story. I'm not going to sit, pa- I'm not going to sit in the passenger seat, right? I want to be in the driver's seat. Yeah. So I want to know that I have full control over where my career is headed and so that has, I think, that being a control freak and yeah. wanting to, to, to feel like, okay, I, I have full control over everything that's going on in my life, that has also kind of played a role into it. Yeah, and I think that's some of... You just have to chase after it. Like, yeah. You don't... Again, shy boys don't get sweets. Like, you don't just get given something just because you're there like you have to chase after it and you have to really want it for it to come a reality like if if I was never going to apply or do something I would have never started this journey I would have never got the experience that sort of I've had to this point because of that like you have to want to chase it and you have to like something as well that I think some people might and I know I'm quite bad for it sometimes, but you had said something to me during our internship and it was like paralysis by analysis. Like some people can get so caught up on that, oh, what if I don't get it? Or let me research everything that there is to it. But by that point, it's gone. Like that has happened. So I think there's there's also a bit of risk-taking skill that comes into it. It's like obviously... You have to want it and you have to chase it, but at the same time, you have to not be scared to chase it. Yeah. And another thing is, you know, you talk about risk, um, like it's, it's, a, it's taking a risk, but it's like, what are you, what are you risking? You know, it's, it, it, it costs no money to reach out on Instagram. Yeah. Um, it costs no money to send a cold email. It costs no money to to ask for a five minute phone Conversation, call. Yeah. So what are you really risking? You're just risking the rejection. And you like you if you're afraid of rejection more than you are afraid of learning or not learning, then there's something wrong there. Yeah, hundred percent. I think you have like you have to be more afraid of not knowing being ignorant and staying where you are more so than falling flat on your face because every time you fall flat on your face you'll at least you know learn how to (laughs) how to look down and walk where you're going yeah so off the back of that what's some advice that you'd give like new coaches or people that are thinking about joining this industry I'd say be a nice person be uh, have good intentions have a good heart um, be open minded obviously like working hard is there's no way around that you want to be good at anything you got to work hard you got to make sacrifices consistency as well you got to yeah and you have to have the perseverance to to swim through some shit yeah but but you know at the end of the day if if you are truly a good person at heart i i i think you'll 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 be all right because people will gravitate towards that yeah i think from my career anyways is really early on i read conscious coaching and like that book sort of spoke to me about like the different people that you might come across in this industry 
people have different backgrounds people have different situations that's happened in their life and you can't coach everyone the exact same like that's mm-hmm. not going to work some like and we've obviously worked together so i know that we can shower each other and that'll motivate mm-hmm. motivate motivate us to push further and harder mm-hmm. but there might be some people that you shower and they just close they lock up like that's not how to coach so i think going back to your point being a good person and just having the understanding that everyone is going to be different and everyone's going to want to be coached or want to be spoken differently as well i think that 100 yeah. percent rings true for this industry as well another big point for me was obviously we know coach mac for coach mac people might just know him as an snc coach but one of the first things that he he wrote in his books was like treat the cleaner like he would treat the ceo so for me i was like that makes sense like everyone's the exact same but that never really clicked until i saw him and i was co- like under his mentorship and i was like i think it was uh red white and boom and there was something happened and there was a mess on the floor and i saw coach mac get on his hands and knees and start like cleaning and i was like hold on he's he's not just meaning that like he is about that life like he is he's like he is that person like if it doesn't matter how big he is like he didn't have to that do that he could have got us one of us to do it but he was like i'll take it it's, it's on me and i was like damn like that's for being in a position that he is just that to me was just like it was just it was really like it really touched me and i was like Fuck, like that's 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 the kind of man and coach i want to be when i'm at that position yeah a hundred percent again it goes back i think it goes back down to um your your values as a person that's that, that's why i always say like behind behind every coach behind every behind every professional there is a person there is a human being yeah we we are not just strength and conditioning coaches we are you are more than your identity is not just the profession that you that you're in yeah it's a career that you you work in your your identity you're manny silvera like i'm brandon chu and like there's only one of each of us there's a person behind behind every everyone and we're all yeah we're all human beings yeah and um i don't really know where i was going with that but (laughs) at the end of the day just fucking be Be a nice nice person person. be a nice person there's 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 no way around it um talking about books the one book that like i will always reference back to and recommend um especially for anyone in a position to influence or deal with uh who who has to deal with people is how to win friends and influence others by dale carnegie i think one of just the there's a reason why that book has stood the test of time there's a reason why that book has stood the test of time as a coach i think it's it's not it's not going to be specific towards coaching but it is specific towards how do you be a good leader how do you how do you truly make people feel valued how do you make how do you make people want to be around you yeah how do you be a good person there are a lot of like little things in there that uh, a lot of good gems Lessons. a lot of good gems yeah yeah i think this is it as well as like you don't know what you know until you know so i think continue reading and just expanding that knowledge base and reaching out to people picking their brains i think that's the best way to go about this industry and just any industry in general like yeah you you have to keep wanting to thrive for that next knowledge next point of your career yeah and then understanding that also um when you look up to people and you think like they've got it all figured out yeah you know like it's not always the case it's, no 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 it's it's never the case if you think about it like even for example when you're growing up as a kid 
right? And you look up to your parents. And I know everyone as a kid, when they looked up to their parents, your parents look like they have everything figured out. That is not the case. Because when you, until you become an adult and you realize all the stresses that come with life, uh, let alone having kids and yeah. then having to parent kids, uh, which is probably the hardest job of all, you, you, don't, you don't realize how much shit that they have to deal with and what they got going on and you realize that man they were just they were just throwing noodles at the wall and seeing what sticks yeah. you know um and most people are like that you're always going to be well you you always need to have that white belt mentality in the sense that you you're you're never going to be at a point where you're going to be like okay yeah. yeah i know it all because if you ever do reach that point then you know you got to you got to pivot. You got to do something. Um, you must be a freaking savant or something. Yeah. Or tapped um, out your full potential. This actually, so I've got an SSC friend coach, uh, Mia. She's, she went to Arizona at the same time that I went to UW. Um, and one of the th- lessons that she learned was that you, you need to know who to give a shit sandwich to and who to give a nice sandwich to. So it's essentially like people that have been comfortable all their lives, you need to feed them a little shit. Just bring them back to earth, give them a lesson that's mm-hmm. going to be like, yeah, like you you need to, to keep pushing. But people that have dealt with shit all their life or have had these experiences, you need to like help them on a little bit as well. So I think knowing how to balance that between like your athletes or people you've got coming in, I think that's quite an important lesson to all of so have when you're punching. I was just listening to a podcast and it, it, this this kind of tangent um, reminds me of what I just heard. Um, th- this is a uh, this is a an idea from Alex Hermosi. Mm. Uh, he said that you know when we think about traits, right, that we want to develop in a person whether it's patience, hardworking, work ethic, hardworking, work ethic are the same thing. Um, <laughs> compassion, empathy. Uh, we, we think about all these traits that we want, but we never really talk about, okay, so if we were to develop an ideal human being, how would we teach, if we were to uh, develop a human being from start, how would we teach them patience? Yeah. Would it be by, you know, giving everything uh, that they want when they want it, probably not. You probably put them in a situation where they'd have to do some work or they'd have to wait and wait and wait in order to get what they want. That's how you develop patience. Same thing as like hard working or um, developing work ethic or compassion or empathy. Like you, you probably have to go through some shit to develop some of these qualities. You have to put your nose to the grindstone at some point and um yeah s- sadly like well i don't know if it's sadly or luckily but <laughs> like s- some people some people never have to experience that yeah. and, you know that and and so is life right yeah um everyone's dealt a different hand of cards but yeah so yeah. It, it, you know. what's the biggest um driving motivational factor for you like why why have you wanted to keep pushing and keeping on that grind and just going after it honestly uh, I mean the like if, if we're talking specifically as a coach it goes back to what we were talking about earlier which is I didn't always have great coaches around me and be and like at in, in times where I needed it Especially, I didn't have many good mentors or, or guidance from anyone, uh, nor did I really have any family support. And so, and it led me down some uh, dark roads. And so, if I can then turn around and become that person for someone else and provide value and truly serve, then that's that's ultimately i've I've come to find that that's one of my deepest values and that brings yeah. me the most fulfillment and so yeah specifically as a coach 
um, that that's that's why I want to do what I do. And if we're talking about as a person, um, life in general, <laughs> it's it's yeah, it's I think um, I mean recently I've been thinking about this a lot, uh, but because I, I was struggling a little bit trying to figure out exactly you know where where I wanted my life to go and what direction I wanted to take it I, I think I decided like yeah you know on my deathbed uh, you know I want to put myself in that situation where like okay if if I were to die on my deathbed sometime soon or tomorrow or whenever do I want to look back on my life and thinking about all the things I could have done or should have done or wish I had experienced versus reminiscing about all of the crazy decisions all the um, risks all the gambles all the like holy 50, shit 50s, yeah. I, I, di- I did that um, or crazy adventures that I went on I'd much rather have uh, a very vivid and colorful life than a yeah. very boring and mundane one and so you know knowing that and knowing that death 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 looms over all yeah and that my reminding myself that you know it's not something to be scared of but more so of like forces you to okay yeah i do have a deadline so i i want to do as much as i can before i before i eventually get there so yeah that that's i think that's what drives me it's like knocking on those heaven doors just like all scratched up and fucked up just be like yeah i'm here but I had an yeah, enjoyable it's, day. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it sounds kind of morbid, but like, I mean, yeah, that, I don't. It's death, death, death isn't a scary thing. If we didn't have death, man, I would, like, you know, like there there would be no reason to want to live. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because if if you didn't know, if you didn't have a deadline, then you could just spend your days doing nothing at all. And it'd be fine because you're not ever wasting your yeah. time. But death is what makes time so valuable. Yeah, hundred percent. So, what's the next move? Oh, next move. Uh, what are you currently driving towards? I mean, uh, my I, I guess my next move, and this is a more broad, long term thing, but. I mean, it's 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 being the best technician that I can be. And I want to learn as much as I can right now. Um, there's still so much that I don't that I don't know that I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, broadening my perspective is just trying to add as many tools to the toolbox as possible. Because again, you know, I'm still so young in my career. Yeah. In I think. Ter- yeah. I think it's a really good place that you're at just now because obviously you're at NYC and you're in that um, so you're, you're dealing more with general population and I think I've personally got experience of coaching general population and I know how much adaptability and versatile versatility yeah. that you need to sort of like coach everyone that comes in through the door so I think if you want to speak about that experience so far like I think that's a really valuable to go if you want to be the best coach that you can be as yeah, no, a hundred percent. Working with general population, it goes back to problem solving, meeting them where they're at, figuring out, okay, how do we then bridge the gap from where you currently are to where you want to be, while also addressing your weaknesses that I that I see as a coach. Um, so far, it's been a huge, huge learning experience. Um, especially adapting to different personalities uh like you said earlier uh going back to the book of conscious coaching um not everyone's going to respond the same way and so learning how to adapt to different personalities has been uh, a big uh learning point learning learning how to give because uh, when you're working with general population ultimately they're the ones paying you yeah for for your services you know when you're working with athletes they have no choice so they have to listen to you so it doesn't and like you can talk about creating buy-in and stuff like that uh yes that's important um i think with general population it's even more important it almost turns into selling 
yeah. right? We were talking about sales. But like, how do you get that person to buy in and yeah. and, and uh, sell themselves on what you have to offer them and that value that you can bring to them, right? And so then how do you deliver a service that is worth the money that you were charging them? Um, how do you how do you address their needs that you see their weaknesses that you see as a coach while still making the workouts the training engaging and fun and you know giving them what they want yeah. as well i think so, a big part of it is transparency and clarity through the whole thing as well like it's it's one of the rare moments that at least for me i see in this industry is that there's a lot of like faff and just like Instagram's mm-hmm. full of it where you just like hype mm-hmm. up 12, 6, 5, 4 weeks mm-hmm. and you'll get your summer body it's like mm-hmm. it's not quite how it works like you you have to put in the work you have to be consistent and it's I think yep. for, for me as well as like when I'm coaching general population I'm very honest with them I'm just like look I can do my best but I also need you to do your best like you're going to have mm-hmm. you're going to want to not come in some days give me a message i'll talk to you i'll just just explain them like this is a slow and hard process you will get your goals and you will achieve them but we need to like have that communication and clarity between me and you and we need to be honest with each other if you had a cheesecake at the weekend like okay that's fine Mm -hmm. we'll go back to the drawing board and picture something else up or do something or talk about something as to like why that urge was there and some like I think clarity and transparency during these programs and during your conversations is key as well. A hundred percent. Again, it um if there's anything that being a strength conditioning coach has taught me is like how you develop that buy-in is by involving your athletes, your clients in the process and explaining to them, being able to explain to them um, where your where your thought process is and it's not just random workouts every week and there's, yeah. there's a direction we're trying to head and this is this is the game plan of how we're going to get you from where you're currently at and to where you, you want to go and I, I mean again and it depends on each client because you know some clients it's like hey don't you know i don't care about any of the bullshit just just train me like i trust you just train me those are fucking amazing yeah. clients to have and then other clients they're going to be like Wait, why are we doing this why are we doing it this way why are we and they're, they're going to start questioning it goes back to the book conscious coaching right there's going to be a bajillion different types of personalities you have to deal with especially in general population especially in a place like new york city yeah man um, like today I had um, uh, I have this couple that comes in and works out together that I train um, together and the girlfriend came up to me and was like hey you know um, I understand like you, you want me to be strong and stuff like that but I feel like my legs have just blown up and I don't want to get big and uh, so and I really don't like like doing the weights and stuff like that and we, we've been training for about two uh like two months now and i you know what i like i could be i could be the hard old coach and say like no like okay listen like th- well this is why weights work and this is this is where i'm trying to go i'm trying to i'm trying to you know like uh this is why we should lift um every time i see you and stuff like that no nah, i was just like instead of taking that approach i was like hey you know what like i i hear your concerns and i'm going to go back and i'm going to see what Um, changes I can make and though we might not be lifting as heavy like uh, I think I had them doing trap bar deadlifts today Uh, we were were starting a new phase and in this phase we were trying to increase um, doing some like strength and hypertrophy type work and so we had trap bar deadlifts and she really didn't like the trap bar she really doesn't like dumbbells and she was saying like, hey, can we do like more Pilates and cardio and core type movements and stuff like that? And I was like, hey, you know what? If that's what makes you happy, I'm, 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 I'm all for it. So, 
you know what? Instead of trap bar deadlifts next time, maybe her boyfriend can do the trap bar deadlifts, but she'll be holding a like a long lever hamstring plank, right? We're still getting the target tissue. Sure, the load might not be as heavy, but are we still training? Yeah. Does yeah. she is she happy? Yeah. If um, you know she she wants to use a bunch of other implements, and so instead of using a dumbbell for a row, okay, maybe we can do it with the band. Right. Okay. Maybe we can change up the the position so so it keeps her engaged and it's yeah. not like oh I'm just doing a standing row. Okay. Like let's try doing it from a quadruped, right? And then we'll do um do a row that way. And yeah. then so it feel it feels more engaging. And so yeah, sometimes you have to add a little bit of fluff into your program to allow your clients to stay engaged. But and then that goes back to the art of coaching. Yeah, right? it's you can write the best program in the world, like if you can't coach, if you can't coach it, if you can't adapt it on the fly based on the person yeah. you're working with, then man, throw that program out the window. It don't matter. Yeah, I've so I've recently had some experience like that as well, where I've got this person that comes in and she she watches a lot of Instagram and TikTok, and like she was asking me like, how do I do an RDL? And I was like, okay, let's walk through it. Like she nailed it first time, but because she had had someone shout at her saying that she was doing it wrong, like it created a cycle. Mm-hmm. And for me, I was just like, it's just fucking movement. That's all. Like a row is a row. Like your lats can only move in a certain way. Your rhomboids can only move in a certain way. Movement's movement. Whether you've got a band, whether you've got dumbbell, a kettlebell, a barbell, movement's movement. And I think that is a hundred percent right. If someone's not into like lifting heavy weights you can always adapt it and always make it tailored to what they kind of envision themselves doing and i think that's one of the biggest things i've learned from gen general population is just like being able like just like what you've just said being able to adapt things on the fly and just like that's not working fine let's do something else let's try something else let's go back to drawing board and just i i, I was gonna add um this makes me think back to the question of you know, if there's any advice, what would I give to uh, young S and C coaches? Um, like, keep your ego in check. Yes. Like you, you want to think you know it all. <laughs> um, I've been there, man. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with it right now. Where, um, like, hey, I'm the coach, and I could, I'm, I'm in the position where I can say, like, nah, we're lifting weights, like. Pilates. Well, let me tell you why Pilates don't work. Yeah. Well, let me tell you why only doing core work wouldn't work or doing cardio in our one time per week sessions wouldn't work. Right? Like I can find a way to address it and and communicate it better. And the, the, I mean that's something I'm constantly trying to improve um, of having that open conversation with that client, but again, it takes time and sometimes you got to put your ego aside and be yeah. like, "Hey, you know what? I'm not going to I'm I'm not the expert on your body and it's okay. You can tell me what you're feeling, right? And then let's let's both let's both find a way through this together. As a coach, I'm here to to help guide you, right? I'm not going to tell you where to go. Yeah. I'm just helping you guide you towards where you want to go. So I'm I'm just along for the ride. I'm here to help you in your process. This isn't my process. Yeah, like your clients never should be having to meet you where you're at as a coach. You have to go meet them where they're at, and then take them to where they want to go. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So yeah, swallow that ego. Be okay with the rejection. Yeah, um, it's a, it goes back to what we were saying earlier. It's just not being afraid of getting that no. Like that's there's not like that's the worst that's going to happen, and it doesn't matter that much. It's like having that ability to just be like okay like that the body is yours you know what you're feeling better than i am than than i do so I, yeah yeah don't don't marry yourself to your current philosophies or your current exercises or anything like that you want to be as adaptable as possible and that's how ultimately how you're going to be successful yeah and yeah don't don't think that um, there's only ever one way to do anything. Yeah, you know, movement, there's a movement. bajillion ways. Yeah, be creative. Think outside the box. It's okay. Innovate. 
experiment yeah i think that's really important and as well like being in gyms as well as like having that creative ability to think about like i've not got a sled what can i do instead it's like Mm -hmm. i've been in that situation i've been in a small gym there was no slides i wanted to do slide pools i grabbed a step put a bunch of kettlebells tied a battle rope onto one of the kettlebells made slide pools it's like yeah thinking about these i I think for me as well as like if you're going to be a coach and coach mark spoke about this like i think tony spoke about this as well it's like sometimes they've been in situations where kit was supposed to be there but the kit wasn't there so they've had to like do manual assisted exercise instead without any kit and just whole session on that i think having that pliability with your coaching and just how you express your coaching and express the exercise that you're talking about i think having that ability to go and explore i think that's that's key a hundred percent man talk about like nightmare stories in which um i mean obviously it makes you more resilient as a coach and this is why i think strength and conditioning produces so many amazing coaches is because you have to deal with like for example coach fight he had this story of how they had like 20 kids sign up for this one class or one session in their training facility and it's a small training facility they could probably accommodate 20 people or something like that and then the training session comes around and for some reason there's 40 kids and all of a sudden you have you double the amount of people that you were prepared for and you just gotta make it work yeah. and you know what sometimes it might just be a fucking dumpster fire but the kids don't know that yeah show <laughs> and and you might in your head being like holy crap this might like this is this is blowing shit but like in those moments you have to you can't just throw up your hands and be like oh shit i guess i'm not coaching today right yeah. no you gotta you gotta figure it out on the fly and 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 troubleshoot and so um going back to yeah coach mac tony like what what happens when you're you program sled pushes and you don't have sleds well do we just not do them yeah. like well we gotta do something so i think that's as well and that brings me back to my next question is like while we were at UW, we obviously were fortunate enough to lead our own sessions and my first session i got zero warning of it so i should i i think we were doing the i think it might be one of the cod sessions i was paired with aj and coach mark comes up to to us and was like we need someone on um on return to play mm-hmm. and then he points at aj was like who have you got and then he was like manny and i was like i was like kind of caught in the the headlights i was like oh i've yeah. never done that i've never <laughs> yeah. had to take like especially at a high level like in scotland there's not i've there's nothing like that i wasn't mm-hmm. i've never been in charge of a whole program for division one athletes so for me i was like fuck it, it's a sink or swim kind of moment where you either grab it by the balls and do the most of it or yeah you just sink and i remember like, i was nervous had no program had nothing prepared with them and I was like got it so the first time I started timing one of the players started speaking to me I lost my time and I was like oh fuck so like I started panicking and I was like right okay breathe go back to the session just add, keep adding exercises at this point AJ comes in and I'm like oh shit I better not fuck up because like now there's coaches watching me and there's interns and I think you came in at that point as well and you're like let's go Manu and I was like fuck <laughs> I've just fucked up <laughs> so but, like it's that thing it's like you need to keep it calm and you need to keep cool like even if it's a shit show that you're doing like having mm-hmm. that patience and confidence to be like okay let's at least pretend like I know what I'm doing it's a, it's a kind of fake it till you make it essentially oh 100% there yeah that I mean, uh, there is there's a magician that I listen to his podcast. Uh, he talks about how like every magician in the world is just pretending to be a magician because magic isn't real, right? And so magicians it's inherently not. are just pre- yeah, right, crazy <laughs> shit. 
<laughs> You're telling me that you can't actually find my card? Damn it. Um, I've been fooled. But uh, yeah, like every every magician is just pretending to be a magician. It's a I think a great analogy for anything. Like we we just step into these roles. We put on our chef's hat when it's time to cook. We put on our coach's hat when it's time to coach. We put on our parent hat when it's time to parent. It is like we again we're we're all just figuring it out as we go. We we don't we don't have all the answers. And so um what it comes down to is your ability to think it through in the moment, your ability to just adapt and try and be okay, just roll with the punches, be okay with 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 it not being okay. Yeah. I think that's because it never will be. Yeah. And you're never going to get it right 100% of the time. It just does not happen. Exactly. Exactly. Like, even after that session, like, I'm pretty sure I messed up every session I took solo. Um, mm -hmm. But going back to it, what's, what was your experiences with your solo sessions and taking the group through the drills that you were running them through? Um... I mean, it's the same thing as you, where I was doubting myself in the sense of like, am I, well, actually, you know, thinking back to the, to the moment, I, I didn't have much doubt in myself in the sense, more, more, more so in the sense of not like I was like, oh, I'm ready for this. Like, oh, I've, um, like, I'm going to crush this. It's more so of like, you know what? Like I have this opportunity. Like you said, I'm going to grab it by the balls. I'm gonna fully make the most out of this opportunity. I this is my opportunity to be the coach that I eventually want to be. Yeah. And so whether I, you know, fuck up or not, you know, I'm not even gonna care about that. I'm just gonna. Be, I'm just worried about being the best coach in this moment, right now. And so yeah. and yeah, there there are times where like players are, uh, like talking back to me in the sense of like, yo man, like there there are times where I mess up, right? I mess up some of the calls, and they're like, yo, like yo, you got to get your shit together. And I'll be like, you know what? You're right. I'll I'll, I'll give you, yeah. um, I'll give you up downs for that. And I'll drop down. I'll do some up downs. And then I'll get back up. And I'll be like, okay, let's go. Like next next set, right? Next team up. Um, and I'll try my best to. Ex and looking back at it, you know, I, I definitely could have done a better job of communicating clearly, like each drill. Again, like there is just that's just how you learn. You yeah. you have to get reps. You have to get into reps, and you have to put yourself out there, and you have to fall flat on your face. So it's about how hard yeah, you can come back. Yeah, very, very, very similar situation. Very similar situation to you. And yeah, I think like even when we're looking at head strength coaches, um, I also coach Mark in some down ups. Yeah, no, exactly right. You, you, he keeps himself accountable, and uh, but like you, you go into any weight room and. Every every lift's gonna look like a dumpster fire, man. When I was at Springfield, when we would have like three teams in the weight room all at once, our weight room wasn't that big, and we'd have like so many athletes, so many different programs all going at the same time, and there's three strength coaches for each of their teams, and they're trying to figure out how to not step on each other's toes, and um, fi like figuring out all the timing and coordination, like. In their head, it looks like a dumpster fire, but then eventually you get used to it, yeah. and you kind of roll with the punches, and you understand, like, okay, this is, this is how. Yeah, it works. Like when this happens, this is this is what I do. When this happens, this is what I'll do, and then you'll you'll always keep a keep a plan B in the back pocket so that you can always pivot, and so yeah, and obviously like it just comes with experience. Yeah, it comes with I think Coach AJ. You, put it best it was like I think that that was the first time he's ever led like a mentorship type program where he was the one in like charge of the educational side and he was like mm -hmm. honestly guys like you've been pulled in a million and different like a million and one different directions and your ability to keep up and just thrive in this situation like was what the best that I could ever ask for from you guys I think it's that mm -hmm. I think appreciation for the people that are underneath as well that that really drives that right I, i'm appreciated here i know that you'll need to show off at some point um so thank you so much for coming on bra uh true i was about to call you brandon that's really weird yeah that's really <laughs> weird god 
Um, so <laughs> thank you for jumping on. Do you want to shout out your Instagram or anything else or plug that you've been working on? Or actually, I did want to say your social media recently been amazing. Um, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. One of your most frequent videos, the squatting one, the variations. Yeah. It's so well yeah. done, but. Obviously, we've got a relationship, so I think you'd be fine with this. I kind of wanted to make one, uh, but say like the British way, and just for mm. every squat variation that you did, I would do the same, but have a cup of tea with me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Please do that. Please do that. <laughs> so Please I was like, that. yeah, I think you'll appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. With my social media, man, I like, I'm just, I, I, I don't like doing it. I don't like doing this social media thing, but I think what's made it better for me is not doing it with the goal of trying yeah. to like increase follower count or anything like that. It's just doing with the goal of putting myself out there, being comfortable with putting myself out there and um, just doing stuff that I, I tr like that, that is me. Yeah. That is my personality and that I enjoy actually making. Yeah. So that, that's, that's what made has, has made it, a lot more fun and yeah. um but yeah if you want to check that out at just be true on all social media platforms yeah that's why i'm connecting to it i can see like that comedy side that you always have obviously we spoke about like our love and appreciation for just kidding news and like mm -hmm. that whole aspect of like our childhood mm -hmm. and i can see yeah. some of that coming off in your videos i'm yeah. like this is like this is be true like this is this is him so i've really yeah. appreciated that well, I, I really appreciate that, that you enjoy it and that you're showing so much love. Yeah. And I appreciate you for having me on, man. Nah, it's all good. Honestly, I've... I, I could sit and chat with you all day. I know, brother. I know. You know and we have, and it's I think that's one of the biggest things that we obviously connected on is our love and passion for this industry and wanting to, to further it. And I think for me, sure. starting this podcast, it was just for that. It's like, I want new snc coaches and old snc coaches and people that want to get into this industry to have like a platform where they can see up and coming coaches established coaches or people that are just interested in this industry or sports i kind of want to just have them on and create that a to z pathway obviously yep. i can't create the pathway for you you're going to have to reach out and do it for yourself but at least having some general guidance and knowledge on where to start and where to go or internships how to reach out so i think yep. having you on has honed on that because like we're both new like we've had the same exp mm -hmm. well Other experiences yeah. yeah um different internships that we've had that have sort of shaped some of the way we think or some of the way that we build programs and speak to people i think having new coaches in to still deliver that message and be like look it doesn't start pretty, it doesn't start flashy, but you just kind of have to get the reps in and you kind of have to yeah. just go for it. For sure. For sure, man. No. Dude, it's been awesome. Yeah, I appreciate you for coming on. Um, obviously, at Just Be True, follow him. He's amazing. <laughs>